Good morning. I wish that we could have a complete worship service for you. I sure miss the choir and I miss the piano music and the organ music and having an elder serve as a liturgist and having children come up. Um, but all you get this morning is me. <laughs> and I hope that that will be of some help to you. So to remind you of where we are in our consideration of the last week of Jesus' life, we are now at Friday, and there are just several hours left in his life. And we pick up the story when Jesus comes before Pilate. And uh, the Sanhedrin, which was in Israel, would have been like the religious version of our U.S. Supreme Court. They had all the authority to determine what's, what's proper, what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false. And um, unfortunately, they were not godly men, and they were driven by jealousy. They were envious of, of the uh, acclaim that Jesus was gathering, and they felt that they had to get rid of him. So they sent him to Pilate. They had, they had uh, accused him and rendered him guilty of blasphemy and, uh, and insurrection because they said that he said he was the king of the Jews. So they sent him to Pilate, who's the governor of Israel, a Roman authority who does have the authority to execute people. And uh, so they send him there hoping that he will ex find Jesus guilty of these charges and then uh, order his arrest. So we pick it up on, uh, in Matthew chapter 27. And I'm going to read through this thing slowly and just make comment as we go along. So if you have your Bible handy, uh, I would encourage you to open to Matthew 27, starting at verse 11. And just remember that the Sanhedrin had just brought Jesus into Pilate's court. And uh, so starting at verse 11, we read, Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony that they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at that festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So the crowd had gathered. Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who's called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, don't have anything to do with this innocent man. For I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Messiah? That's a good question. It's a question that every human being one day is going to have to answer. What shall I do? What shall you do with Jesus, who's called Messiah? And uh, so he asked them, what should I do with him? And they say, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Pilate asked. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And so Pilate washes his hands and says he's, he's free from this man's uh, of his guilt and uh, and the people say his blood be upon us and upon our children that's a fascinating thought in itself but so let's take a look at what's going on here you have Barabbas who is a a well-known criminal he would be what we would call today he was a terrorist he was insurrectionist against Rome and he had been guilty of, of murder, and he was on the death row. 
And Jesus is the innocent, the perfect sin of Son of God. And so Barabbas walks out of his prison cell and he goes home. And Jesus goes to be crucified. What's going on there? How, how can we explain this great mystery? Well, the key to unlocking the mystery of this is the principle of substitution. The principle of substitution. And by that, I mean that God chooses to act through a person on behalf of the whole. So we think back of Adam. We think of Adam in the garden who disobeyed God and his sin and disobedience because of what he did brought a curse on all of us, on, on all of creation. I remember as a young Christian thinking about that and, and being angry and thinking, how in the world could we all be condemned because of one man? Well, the fact of the matter is that any one of us, if we had been in his situation, would have done the same thing. So he was our representative into ruination. And so if there was a first Adam that brought on ruination to us, is it possible that there could be a second Adam who would bring redemption to us? And that's what we find here in Jesus. Uh, Barabbas went home that night, and I imagine that he was glad to bathe and get into clean clothes and to have a warm meal. And I wonder that night if he ever pondered about this Jesus, who he knew was innocent and yet who went to the cross on his behalf. I wonder what he thought. I wonder if he felt a sense of gratitude or curiosity or what for how, how this works. Well, I, wanna, I want us to follow this principle of substitution in two directions. First of all, Jesus is our substitute for uh, in his perfect obedience to God's law. Jesus, who is the Son of God, who lived eternally, uh, was outside, was beyond the law. But when he came to earth, he put himself under the law. And at every point, he obeyed his Father perfectly. Even when it got more and more difficult, his obedience was unfailing. And uh, so what does that mean for us if he is our substitute? Well, it means this for you and for me. That one day we're going to stand before God, a perfect God who has made his laws to uh, make the universe run properly, to make humans be able to live together in peace and prosperity. And uh, he uh, has every right to expect his laws to be obeyed. But they weren't, but Jesus did. And so now when we stand before the Father on the day of judgment, he's going to look and he's going to say, Ron, Chris, did you keep my laws perfectly? And all I'll be able to say is no, but somebody did for me. Somebody did on my behalf. And so I share his perfect obedience, his sinless obedience. That's one way in which this principle of substitution works. His perfect righteousness for my sake. The second aspect of it is his payment of the penalty for my sin in my place. Uh, that the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And all of us have sinned and fallen short, short of the glory of God. And so because we have broken God's laws, we rightly come under his judgment. There is a penalty to be paid when laws are broken, when God's laws are transgressed. There is a penalty because there's an effect, because that sin is inherently destructive. There is a penalty to be paid. And Jesus paid that penalty 
I want to read to you something wonderful out of Isaiah, Isaiah um, 53. It says, Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And so this miracle, this wondrous uh, principle of substitution is that Jesus took our place and he put on us his perfect righteousness so that we can stand uh, unaccused, we can stand free before the Father. Uh, one of my favorite hymns, It Is Well With My Soul, the second verse goes like this, My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but in whole, was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Beloved, he has done this for us in our place. He took our punishment and he made us perfect righteousness before our Heavenly Father. To him be all glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. And let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the wondrous mercy that you have shown us in your son Jesus how his perfect obedience has become credit on our account and his sacrifice has been in our place so we stand before you as his children free forgiven forever in Christ's name we pray amen be blessed this day